get Ryan on board here. Ryan is a fellow instructor who uh, joins Phil and I in, in teaching in the DEFER or the Digital Forensic Incident Response Track. Ryan is a 4610 instructor. For anyone here, that is our malware reverse engineering course. And uh, Ryan has taken it upon himself to take, quite frankly, one of the most difficult, intricate, puzzle-laden courses and simply said, yep, I want to teach that one. I'm going after it. And um, I actually uh, had a chance to meet Ryan in person for the first time before he did his first teach. And to say he was excited would be to say that the Titanic was a rowboat. And um, that just clearly is not a, a good way of describing it. He was beyond excited. And I think all that enthusiasm shines through. Um, little known side factoid, Ryan and I almost worked together as well uh, in a professional capacity. I think we missed each other. Ryan, by what? Maybe like a month or so? month, yeah. I think, I mean. Yeah. There was a very, very, very short uh, pass. But there we go. Yep. There we go. He's supporting himself. Um, had a very, very uh, near, near miss there, if you will. But I'm excited to have him on here. Excited to have him talking to us. Ryan's talk today is going to be hunting human-operated ransomware operators, which uh, is a good uh, – that's got to be an acronym here of something. That yeah, you got to be careful with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going any further than that. We'll just leave yeah. it as, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Chapman. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, folks. My name's Ryan, and I'm here to talk about hunting humans, specifically humans involved with ransomware. So I am an incident response analyst with BlackBerry, formerly Silence. I'm a Forensic 610 instructor. Absolutely love teaching those courses. And I now am the lead organizer for CactusCon, which is Arizona's premier security and hacker conference. <laughs> did, I, did I sell you on that? Uh, we're kicking off in February, so come, come check us out online. All right, let's get to it. Ransomware has evolved, and the days of the initial stage or secondary stage being ransomware immediately after someone clicks something silly and gets infected and the one or maybe a couple machines in a given subnet become encrypted, that is becoming more and more a thing of the past, of yesteryear. And now we are seeing these targeted attacks by these groups that are really good at what they do. So if you're familiar with Maze, Ryuk, Revol, SamSam, a couple of the bigger name ransomware attacks, what we're going to talk about right now are some hunting methods for identifying them for when they get into your environment. Because if you don't prevent them or identify them quickly, you're going to realize that by the time you do find them, it's already too late. Prevention and detection are key. And the reason for that is they carry out these attacks very similar to like an advanced threat group, whether it's nation state sponsored or not. They're going to get into your environment. They're going to move around laterally, uh, privilege escalation here and there, grab all kinds of stuff they want. They're going to stage a bunch of your information after doing internal recon, and they're going to steal it. They're going to exfiltrate it out. So if anyone's familiar, for example, with the maze shaming site, mazenews.top, be careful about going there, by the way, uh, they, they're shamelessly like, hey, i tell you what, you have three to 10 days to pay up, or not only are you not going to be able to resume operations quickly, not only may you not receive your data back if you don't have great backup infrastructure and have tested it and it works, but we're going to expose your data and your client's data and your client's client's data. And everything we found, we took it. We're going to give it away to the world. And so that is a huge problem to deal with. So let's talk about some quick wins against this type of attack. Now, when these folks get into your network, I have to say I've dealt with many of these this year in addition to last year. They are not super stealth. In fact, I don't think they really care to be. I, don't, I, don't, I think it's kind of by design. It's financially motivated. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to go boop, 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 and sucks for you. Um, they can be within the environment. Their dwell time can be days to actually almost a year, months. But while they're there, they're not very quiet. And they do very similar things each time between these groups. That's what we're focusing on now. We're focusing on like the jiu-jitsu black belt who has perfected the easiest moves. And before your match, they stare at you right in the face and they say, here's what I'm going to do. Boom, boom, boom. And you say, nuh-uh. And then they do it anyway because they're just that good. That's what these ransomware operators are doing. So I chose to focus on how to find them as soon as they get into the environment. That's my primary focus for this talk. Now, first up, you're going to want to have a hunting environment that is augmented and that facilitates this type of analysis that we're going to be doing. So it's very important that you understand what you are logging 
and that you understand what you are not logging because many folks don't realize what gaps they have. So it's important to take note of these things. I've provided a bunch of resources for you to check out after the talk. It's gonna, you're gonna have the PDF posted so you can click on these links and it will describe if you need to identify these types of things, look for these things, but make sure you're logging the following. So these cheat sheets are provided by Michael Goff, Hacker Hurricane, fantastic fella. And I highly recommend that you check those out. Additionally, make sure that you have either a very strong EDR within your environment or some type of log augmentation like Sysmon. And I'm going to push Sysmon left and right in this talk. So just, just heads up, if you already have it, awesome. If you don't, stop it, go get it. There's also a tool called Windows Logging Service, which I really, really like. So you should check that out. If, you have a, if you're a government contractor, you can get a deal for Windows Logging Service. And before we get too far into string matching or pattern matching, as far as this hunting is concerned, I do want to say very often, well, actually not as often, that's the whole point of this conversation, but sometimes I should say, these strings will be obfuscated. So if you're dealing with something like maybe a command prompt based stage to malware, right? You're going to want to strip out things like the extraneous characters that you'll find in those areas, a carrot, a tilde, you know, if your SIM or log aggregator supports filtering those things out or doing character replacements, make sure you understand primarily the escape characters for whatever you're looking at. So, and I give these as great examples. Just do replacements on those. Take them out so that your strings can match properly and accordingly. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Sigma. This is a phenomenal framework. I'm sure many folks have already heard of Sigma. Uh, Florian Roth, I call him the granddaddy of Yara because he's so great with that, but he has his hands in many things and he's provided a unified format that you can use. In fact, there's a repo of rules right here that you can go and grab right now. And then if you happen to have any of these Sims, EDRs, aggregators over on the right-hand side, you can convert the rules into your particular search format. So if you don't have a team right now of people who are going to take some of the stuff I'm going to discuss and immediately you know, uh, weaponize it to go search for stuff. Use these as examples. I think it's a phenomenal framework. It facilitates hunting in a, in a major way because it, it helps people share searches and queries. And that's what I want to cover right now, what type of searches and queries that you should be running, you should be making. For initial access for these large ransomware campaigns, and they don't just hit large companies, by the way, like at all, we often see the following for initial access. Banking Trojans. Emitet and TrickBot, they are so freaking common, it's not even funny. So when I got into my position, Matt actually had left some previous work behind. I found your stuff, buddy. And I was looking at it, and he was actually already searching and hunting this stuff from years back. Emitet and TrickBot are so common, and they are so commonly used in these attacks, it's not even funny. So I'm going to focus on finding those, and it can really help you out. And then also RDP. And you might be thinking to yourself right now, you're like, nah, no, don't worry about it, Ryan. I don't have RDP exposed to the internet. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you like 100% sure? Monitor, monitor for it anyway. And then I'm not trying to throw shade at any of the companies listed in this bullet point because I am in love with every single one of these, to be honest. Um, they run a lot of our critical infrastructure, but we do have to acknowledge that over the past year, there have been many vulnerabilities that have been posted and many times these ransomware attackers are taking advantage of those. So you can do your best darn job, but if you happen to have a, a very commonplace, expensive network of plants on the outside, if it has a recent release CVE or a zero day or what have you, like they're gonna get in, right? Let's focus on some of the ways that they can get in. One of them, RDP, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you if you're like, no, 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 I have that taken care of, just monitor it anyway, okay? Many people, Focus on event ID 4624, logon type 10, which is RDP, it's an RDP logon in Windows. Don't forget these other event IDs I have up here at the top, especially 21 through 25 and 1149. You can find some phenomenal RDP-based information in there. What type of things should you be looking for? Well, in general, if you have, for example, just in your firewalls, you can look for, and by the way, I'm calling these example searches here pseudocode, but if any of you are familiar with Splunk, you're like, isn't that just uh, SPL? Well, kind of. <laughs> I just, I have a, a heavy Splunk background, and so it's pseudocode, right? You convert it into whatever you need to for your environment. Looking at port 3389 hits, 
and doing a distinct count, which is what DC is, for destination IP and doing that by source IP, what you're looking for is to set a threshold within your environment, right? You have to do it within your environment. Maybe, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 100, whatever you have going on, or about 100. You're looking to see if any individual IP is trying to hit multiple of your servers on that port. And if it is, is that supposed to be happening? Is that an IT admin working from home or is that something silly? Have there been successes? Like, no, that's ignorant, right? Like find out what's going on there. Looking at 4624 events, you get target username. If you do a distinct count of target usernames, also by the IP address field within those logs, it's the same concept. You're looking for when a single IP is trying to authenticate to multiple users via RDP. If, especially if you have successes within a big list of failures, right? Like, whoopsie, <laughs> go find out what that is. And then always look for, I, I love GOIP based queries. They are like low hanging fruit, really freaking easy. Your points of presence, whatever countries out of which you operate, you look for other countries hitting your stuff on port 3389, especially if there are successes that you wouldn't normally expect. You may have to hunt down some people who are officially traveling and what have you, but that can be a great indicator. And then finally, I've given a Sigma rule here just because I love the Sigma project and that's a fun rule to kind of kick things off. Now, the banking Trojans, oh, Imitent and TrickBot, you little devils. They often come down via malicious documents, right? Malicious doc downloader, if you will. And a lot of times we see a three digit file name for the downloader, the down, excuse me, that the downloader downloaded the malware too, right? The stage two, if you want to call it that. Previously, we saw two to three characters. So here is a regular expression, right? Matching anything up to whatever slash your system wants to use. And then two or three digits dot exe, boom. If you find hits to that, it's a fairly decent fidelity query. Also, looking in the Windows directory for file names that are just numbers, just digits, especially eight to 10 digits, super common with Imitet. Now, keep in mind that when you're looking for this stuff, you're looking at probably file write and then most likely process execution, right? Sysmon has file writes. It also has process execution, which is event ID number one in Sysmon. Windows by default does not log process auditing, so you have to enable that along with command line to grab that, those would be uh, 4688 events. Refer back to the previous slide when you get your PDF at those logging cheat sheets. If you're not logging this stuff now, you want to start logging it. If you are logging mutexes, take a look for any that begin with the letters P, E, M. And then you'll often see a couple of hexadecimal characters, which actually translate to a process ID, but that is often used by Imitet. So if you're getting mutexes, you might as well use them to hunt. Another thing that I, I just have to mention is, and I may be butchering their name, but the Crypto Lamus group is a group of quite honestly, just phenomenal freaking human beings. And I know some of these folks professionally, uh, Matt is a fantastic dude, I love this guy. All these people put a lot of time and energy into trying to shut down, trying to thwart and trying to expose Imitet. They're trying to do their best job to protect the rest of us, basically, right? So check out their website. They provide and produce a bunch of indicators, including actual computed IOCs. So if you're interested in hashes and things of that nature, they're very, very helpful. Now we move to TrickBot, right? For anyone, any uh, Always Sunny fans, there's Charlie freaking out about all the TrickBot DLLs in his environment. And I stole this from Sneaky Monkey on Twitter because it's just phenomenal. TrickBot is a modular based framework and the modules often end in either 32 or DLL 32 in a 32 bit environment or 64 or DLL 64 in a 64 bit environment. And here's an example, I know it's not very large on the screen, but import DLL 64. That's one example right there, right? So we have a regular expression to hunt for a common location for where these are found. Users, a user directory, right? So just dot plus. App data, typically roaming, but also local. And then usually it's two directories deep is what you'll find out. And those change based on the campaign, hence the not a specific attributable name here. Any name for a file ending in either 32 or 64, and then potentially, right? The question mark there, potentially in also ending in DLL, dot DLL. This is a very, very, very high fidelity query. 
In fact, you can take out the directory part completely and still use that to find some stuff. There, are, you'll find some false, false positives in there, but it's a great query to run. And in that same location, if you find a settings.ini file, that is typically the encrypted settings file for TrickBot itself. These locations are used by both Emitet and TrickBot. And if you go to VirusTotal and you look up a sample and it says, hey, hey this is Emitet, Oftentimes it's TrickBot and vice versa. They become so ingrained and wrapped into one another's little worlds. So looking, for example, in app data for executables that are being dropped, let alone that are being executed, let alone that are associated with services. And then monitoring these three folders here, program data and users public, just having EXEs dropped inside those, super, super common with both of these pieces of malware. And monitoring of file rights to the syswow64 directory. Now, obviously that's where your 32-bit DLLs, dynamic libraries and EXEs in a 64-bit environment live. So you can't just alert on anything there, like duh. But look for files being written there and then look to see what's writing it. Is that a Microsoft update process or is that like, you know, Chrome, <laughs> like, like what, or Word or like what's writing that? Look for EXEs and users public. First off, just in general, look in users public. That's one right there. I could put a little, I could just erase that and like, look there. But also specifically when they just have alpha characters and there are five to 10 of them, dot exe, really good indicator of both of these pieces of malware. And then the user profile directors, and this one, I find it so weird, videos, music, or pictures, and then eventually having a dot exe in there. You can actually do a dot star and then a dot exe to identify any level of you know, subdirectories in there. Like who's dropping exe files in their music directories? Except for when you, you know, used to download a ripoff music on Kazaa and it would be like malware, <laughs> right? Same, same concept. Not that you all did that. Services and tasks taken into account. If you're not already logging service installations, for example, or task creations, like go back to those PDFs, check out those logging cheat sheets. Look for any of them that refer to any of the previous directories, for example, that we just talked about, right, in the past couple slides. Additionally, look for any, especially services, whose name is just digits, just multiple digits, and that's it. Especially if they happen to be eight to 10 digits. That is a great identifier for Emitet, so check those out too. And that takes us to the next stage of the attacker's toolbox. This is probably one of my favorite parts here because it is ridiculous, ridiculous. How many times just the regular old string, just the name, Mini Cats, returns a ton of results in an even like slightly moderately sized environment. Many times these threat actors drop the files on the system and don't rename them at all. Not at all. You see Metasploit, Mini Cats, Process Hacker, we see them using angry IP scanner a lot. Maze and Ryuk teams love to use that tool. So just look for IP scan. And you're like, that seems too simple. That's stupid. I'm like, I know, <laughs> I know, but it works. I'm telling you it works. And then over on the right-hand side, I have an example that I've sanitized from a recent case here in C users. I changed the name to legit user, but we see in music, a directory called windows and then Mimi cats underscore trunk dot zip. That tells me that sucker probably came right from GitHub and we see it all the time. So string-based searches for these kinds of tools, you'd be amazed at what you'll find. Additionally, did you know that if a threat actor or you changes the name of an executable, but launches it, that for example, Sysmon event one or even 4688 events will record what's known as the original file name, which is part of the PE header. We covered this kind of stuff in 610, right? I renamed gflags.exe, which is used in some uh, APT attacks for persistence, and we use it for debugging malware. And I named it farts.exe because I'm a very mature adult <laughs> and I had some very important testing to do. So I labeled it farts.exe, I execute it, and you'll notice I still get the original name, the original file name field. You can hunt for things like psexec, or other PS tools or what have you within your environment, not just by name of execution, right, the command line, but looking to see when the command line does not match the original file name. That indicates it has been renamed. Now, in the previous slide, I said often they don't even rename stuff. 
when they do rename it, oftentimes they literally just do a quick rename and then boop, boop, you know, double click it via RDP or whatever, you know, however they're executing it in your environment. So that's like your number one probably takeaway right there if you're logging process execution. It's a great tip. I love it. When we do see renaming of certain tools like Mimikatz, we see certain patterns. We often will see a single character and then either 32 or 64 .exe. So look for any file that is a single character and then ends in 32 or 64. That's an executable. We also see many times malware dropped by these actors will be renamed to a single character .exe. We also see that a lot just to generally in actual exploits that involve shellcode because you know shellcode, the whole idea is to compress the code as much as possible. A single character for the path to save it to facilitates that, especially like tilde.exe. We see that one a lot. And then we have, sometimes you'll see pipes involved. Sysmon captures pipes. Maybe your EDR does. Hopefully you have pipes and mutexes, by the way, within your environment. If you see comspec, that is simply the environment variable for the command prompt, basically. When you see slash C, it means command. And then if you happen to see echo after that, followed by, for example, hexadecimal characters redirecting to a named pipe. That is often part of inter-process communication used by, well, one example is Cobalt Strike. But what we can do for this is just look for like comspec, echo, and pipe. That's it, just those three words. You know, if you have an implicit and, it's just comspec, echo, pipe, boop, hit enter. See what you get in your logs. You may have some fun information. You may even find something like our next fella, Cobalt Strike. Everyone here has heard of CS. Everyone knows that it's a, a commercial framework that's used often for penetration testing. We see it all the time, all the time in these ransomware attacks. And we see it all the time in red teaming, you know, too. The default name for named pipes in this system, I pulled three of them directly from the documentation for this talk. Status underscore 9865. MS agent underscore and then four characters that derived we can derive a pattern from that and so here is our regular expression to look for name pipes that maybe match the default names for cobalt strike and i'm telling you right now many times the default name is used cobalt strike also uses a bunch of PowerShell, as does all kinds of the other tools that we just don't have time to cover today in this short 20 plus minute talk, right? So PowerShell events that are decoded, you can search through them by enabling PowerShell logging. There are multiple event IDs involved. Right now, we're looking at 4104, which happens to be script block logging. Before I mention this, you can take all the things we've talked about thus far and combine them with this mentality of looking for default names. So let's say you're looking at 4103 event, which hopefully you're logging and again, refer to the cheat sheets, right? And you notice that like, oh, this PowerSploit and PowerShell Empire, they have these modules and their names are, you know, so-and-so. Just do string-based searches through your PowerShell logs for those and you'd be amazed at what you'll find. I mean, hopefully not, you don't find some really bad stuff, but you might. PowerShell used in Cobalt Strike often uses the following strings. Do it is a super common string. Sometimes it will be obfuscated with certain escape characters, what have you, but not all the time. So look for it. Look for do it. Just do it. Look for it. And then we have function names. Funk get proc address. Funk get delegate type. And this little fellow down here, I put it in bold because it's a good one to look at. Uh, var code, especially when you see it as being instantiated as a byte array being casted just like this in PowerShell. And especially if you see from base 64, from base 64 string within it, very often it points to Cobalt Strike. Here's an example of a decoded Cobalt Strike PowerShell stage. This is used for one of their beacons. It's used for a lot of other malware now that's ripping off the functionality and even using some of the same names, which is funny. You see the string do it. You see one of the function names right here. You see one of the other function names right there, right? And finally, we have FTP data exfiltration. We see FTP and cloud sites being used the most for data expo. It's crazy. It's like, what year is this, right? It's 2020. They're using FTP often, uh, straight Windows API, what have you. Monitor outbound port 20 and 21. If you're not 
designing a baseline now for what should be allowed out through FTP. Like, please do that. Please do it. As soon as they start stealing your data, if they've made it to that point, the more data they get out the door, the worse it's going to be when you end up having a team like ours come in and we go, oh, dude, that sucks. <laughs> like, you should have found that. Also, if you have FTP going to outside of your points of presence. So again, if you're operating in country A and B, anything outside of that, like what's that? Can you just like block that out right in your firewall? Like don't let it happen. Monitor for WinSCP and FileZilla. Mary gave an awesome talk on WinSCP. So if you happen to have a chance, take a look at her talk for what you could do if you find a tool like this. And you'd be actually quite surprised at how much data you can get and amass on your threat actor. And then PowerShell natively, you can look for system.net.ftp web request. It's super common within these attacks. They just you go right into PowerShell and go do, 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 and just send your data right out. And then finally, cloud-based sharing sites. I, I failed. I failed everyone miserably. I apologize. I should have included mega on this slide because it is mega, mega common. So if you don't approve using certain file sharing sites within a policy, and I hope that have a policy around that, by the way, then look for sites that are outside of your policy. Calculate byte counts out and alert or hunt when they're over a certain threshold, right? Even just a couple hundred megabytes. Like, what's that? Why is that leaving and going to the site? You will get most likely a ton of false positives for this kind of stuff, even mega, but it's still really solid to keep your eyes on it so that you can make darn sure that if you have one of these ransomware operators in your environment, you catch them at the very least when they're trying to take your stuff out and you put a stop to it. Because if you let them get the stuff out the door, your day is going to suck. All right. And that's it. That's my presentation. I know I had a whole bunch of information. I, I compressed into that 25 minutes. So please check out the PDF that's going to be available. I will be in the chat for the next at least half an hour answering questions. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very, very much for having me on. I really appreciate it.